So Andrew Block is going to talk to us about how we run Kubernetes in the enterprise. He has a ton of experience with actual OpenShift customers and, open, and large corporations running big Kubernetes clusters, OpenShift clusters in real production settings. He is one of our lead consultants, one of our top gurus here at Red Hat, and I'm very excited to have him, have him here. So there's Andrew. How are you doing, Andrew? Hey, bro. How's it going? Oh, very good, very good. We've we, we've totally killed crowd, Crowdcast today. I so if tell. you see information about, hey, it's not working, just kind of ignore that. We're running through as much as possible and getting these things recorded. But feel free to share your screen and get going. Half the battle is figuring out where the share button is. Yes, it's above your head, actually. There it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, one second. We'll go ahead and do that. Can you see my screen? There it is. All right, we see it. Great. All right, so today's topic, we're gonna to talk about Kubernetes in the enterprise. As you know, being able to deploy Kubernetes anywhere is very easy, whether it be on your laptop, whether it be on, on a server you have out in the cloud, it's easy, but when you wanna deploy it in the enterprise, things change, things change quite a bit. So first of all, let me, talk, let me, let me tell you about myself. My name is Andrew Block, I'm a distinguished architect at Red Hat. Uh, I've been working in the Kubernetes space for probably about five years, about five, five and a half years before it was even Kubernetes 1.0. Uh, I've been, uh, I specialize in containers and cloud technologies, automation and integration. As Burr already alluded to, I have experience with a lot of customers from the small little guys to some of the Fortune 5 customers, as well as uh, being able to design uh, patterns and distributed systems. And that's really one of the things that I emphasize on. And one of the things that I also like to do is I like to write and teach. And as part of this year, I was able to get a book out there on Helm. Helm is a package manager for Kubernetes. And um, if you're interested in Helm and being able to deploy applications in a packaged way on Kubernetes, take a look at that as well. Uh, you can reach out to me on Twitter and we'll probably get to that near the end of the topic. So first and foremost, why Kubernetes? Well, from our discussions thus far this morning, hopefully you understand the benefits of Kubernetes, everything from containers, microservices, and the ability to atomically package your applications into an atomic unit, being able to manage them at scale, and that's what Kubernetes provides. When I mentioned scale, to burst out, you know, Paul just talked about, you know, being able to burst out and manage all the different components. It's the ability to scale out these, these different microservices at different, different cadences, and it's popular. We've had a lot of conferences recently, KubeCon North America, or pardon me, KubeCon Europe, it's all virtual, so it feels like North America to me where I'm based out of. But as you know, Kubernetes is incredibly popular. One of the biggest and most popular open source projects out there today. So when you want to go ahead and deploy Kubernetes, have you thought about a number of different factors? Everything from security, storage, monitoring, metrics, logging, the user experience, and compliance. These are the things that you need to know when you need to deploy in an enterprise scenario. I can go ahead and spin something up you know, willy-nilly on my laptop, it's great. But when you want to deploy Kubernetes in the enterprise, what does it really look like? And how do you actually accomplish it? And from an enterprise standpoint, and you want to bring Kubernetes in, how do you have your organization adopt it successfully? So it really is a brave new world. You know, if you know, as a developer, you know, by trade myself, I've been working with containers probably for almost you know seven, eight years right now, and it's not new to me. But for, to a lot of organizations, containers are brand new to them. It's a disruptor. I've continued to call containers the Napster of the 21st century. How long does it take you to get a new server provisioned in your environment, in an enterprise environment? It can sometimes take one to three months. On a container, I can go ahead and spin up a, you know, a Postgres database and be able to access it, you know, spin up a Quarkus application, talk to it, and be able to do that all within seconds. If I want to get a full VM stood up in these enterprise environments, that's hard. That's really hard. It takes a long amount of time. What you need to understand is this is complex for a lot of organizations. And that's where containers are a disruptor because it really transforms how organizations see applications and in infrastructure. Now, Kubernetes has a lot of patterns. It has a lot of good things. But the problem is we basically have to jam all the great things about Kubernetes into an enterprise scenario. At times, it's like putting the square peg into the round hole. And that's what we're going to talk through today is how do we actually succeed in applying these patterns 
at enterprise scale. And the first one that I see and is a lot of my customers see is security. And there are three areas of security I want to talk about in the Kubernetes ecosystem. Any organization that brings in a new software component, whether it be Kubernetes, whether it be really any piece of software, they want to understand a few key points. What is the support? Who's supporting this? Is it, is it going to be my app team? Is it going to be an organization like Red Hat or some other third party vendor? Are there any compliance regulations around it? Does it comply with certain standards like HIPAA if you're in North America in, in the healthcare scenario? If you're in the Department of Defense and not in the military, is there any security you need to, need to handle that? And then the third one is vulnerability assessments. Is the software that's coming with the solution, is it meeting any regular regulation standards? And has there been any vulnerability assessments that have been made against it? Organizations want a full list of this before you even get in the door. Now, unfortunately, with the cloud native landscape, it's a lot of technologies. Not only do you have Kubernetes, there's a lot of technologies that are underneath Kubernetes, everything from etcd, which is the database behind Kubernetes. If you have logging and monitoring, you might have Grafana and Prometheus for your monitoring stack. Every single one of these technologies has to be assessed by an organization. Everything from, as I mentioned, from the three pillars that I mentioned on the slide before, compliance, security, everything. So really it's understanding exactly what technologies you want to bring into an organization. They all sound great, but how many do you really need? It's really whittling down these different technologies into only the ones that you want. And engaging with your customers, engaging with your, with your key stakeholders in this initiative will help you understand and curate exactly what resources you need and what solutions you want to bring in. So what are some of the top concerns that do come to mind? Everything from your containers, the Kubernetes control plane, what access and control do you need to be worried about? What type of certificates do you need to implement as part of your solution for to make, make it be secure? Are there any networking constraints? There's a lot of networking with Kubernetes, because there's different components that talk to each other in a distributed fashion. And then storage. I'll have a slide later on that talks about storage, but a lot of people don't think about storage in the microservice world. It still exists, I promise. The number one thing I will suggest is you engage your security team first and foremost. Otherwise, you may have grand aspirations for this great system. You may even go ahead and start POCing and building it. But when you go ahead and actually want to implement it, you always, always have to get approval from your security team. I have been in many large organizations who have built great things, will make the, customer, the company and the customer a lot of money, and we had to delay by six months because security wasn't brought in and we and they didn't sign off and we had to go through all the different security security controls etc and it slowed the project down it had them you know there was some money lost but they were able to deploy it but it was a lesson learned that we needed to engage security ahead of time and we could have gotten across a lot of all these problems and this collaboration between security development operations it really enables and encourages the concept of devsecops the ability to, for security to be in this entire process of DevOps. Oh, we hear about DevOps a lot, but we don't necessarily bring security in until after the fact. If we bring them in ahead of time, it will reduce the amount of burden that we'll have down the road. Now the platform itself. Kubernetes is great. You go to conferences and you see all these different organizations. They talk about the great things that they did with Kubernetes. It doesn't necessarily come fully packaged you have to add to it. Kubernetes is a great control plane. It helps you schedule applications and manage them at scale. But from an organization, there's a lot of different components that you need to consider. And it's up to your administrators, your consumers, everyone to understand exactly what components you want in your enterprise. This is everything from logging, application monitoring, alerting. If you want to build your applications, how do you tie in your continuous integration and continuous delivery systems? A lot of organizations already have that built out. How will that be integrated into Kubernetes? Are you going to switch over and take like an existing system like Jenkins and move to a more cloud native pipeline system like leveraging Tecton? How are you going to handle your secure values? Are you going to uh, leverage a vault of some sort to be able to handle it in a secure way? And one of the benefits about Kubernetes being so popular is a lot of the existing enterprise solutions that organizations already have in place now have support for Kubernetes. Talk to your ISV vendors 
and see what your options are. You don't have to always reinvent the wheel. Talk to your partners and actually try to have them bring more to the table because they may have fully baked in solutions that you can basically just turn on. And number one thing I will emphasize is, as, as to allude to what I just mentioned with other other vendors may already have the solutions that you're already implementing, don't build your own. You may think that, oh, I have this perfect use case, it's gonna be great. In the end, it's gonna be more of a burden because you maybe, maybe only have one or two developers who are working on this and they, they have the tribal knowledge. What happens if they decide to move to a different group within the organization or heaven forbid, leave the organization? You then have to train up your team to be able to have them succeed successfully. And if you look at other solutions, whether it be from a vendor or in the, in the enterprise as a large, go ahead and leverage that. Because I've seen many, many times that these initiatives have failed because of that. The next thing to think about is image management. Containers are the bread and butter of any type of Kubernetes deployment. Think about the different components of your image lifecycle. Everything from first, your image composition. Where is your base image coming from? Only certain types of images are gonna be allowed within an organization, whether it be a, you know, a Red Hat image, whether it be a Ubuntu image, whether it be ones that have certain capabilities in them. Understand what your base image is going to be. Next is your image sources. Where are the images coming from? Are they gonna, I mean, most organizations I work with, they block Docker Hub. Docker Hub has over 75% of the images out there have at least some form of vulnerabilities. So most, most organizations will not allow direct import from Docker Hub. Understanding where your images are coming from and then working with your compliance team to understand how to obtain them. And then where are you storing your images within your organization? You're gonna produce images as part of your, as part of your organization. Where are they gonna be stored? Because typically you can't push them to Docker Hubs or some public repository they need to be brought in and stored internally. So understanding where that's gonna be. So in an organizational standpoint, what are some best practices to, to achieve? First of all, it's your import pipeline. If you need to obtain an image from an external source, how are you gonna get it into your organization? As I mentioned, you typically have those external re registries blocked. You need to provide a common path for not only your operations team, but your development team and other groups within your organization to be able to get those images into your organization. And then internally, building the set of base images for your development teams, being able to ensure that they can go ahead and know what images they can quickly pick up. They know that they're validated, secure, and approved by the organization, and they're up to date, so they can go ahead and build their solutions on top of them. Now, certificates. Now, when we think, now Kubernetes itself makes extensive use of, of, of public key infrastructure. Most organizations have their own certificate authority. You're not gonna be able to go to use like a Let's Encrypt certificate to, or some other public, you know, GoDaddy certificate. Just what are two examples that you can use? One, uh, sorry about that. Seems like I lost my, my presentation. One second. Yeah, you, you can get the full screen back up. All right, we'll get back up here. All right, there we go. Most organizations have their own, own CA. Being able to integrate that into your, or, your organizational process for how do we bring these certificates into the platform? So your APIs for Kubernetes and other, other like consoles can leverage the CA from your organization. Working with your CA team if you have one or even using an operator type methodology to be able to talk with your, if, if your CA happens to expose a API, being able to integrate with that to automate the process of getting signed certificates for not only your platform, but your application resources. Networking is important. Uh, networking organizations have, uh, you think a, a, a being able, a Kubernetes itself is complex. An organizational network is complex. It's almost like a web of, uh, uh, of wires all over the place and different network boundaries. Understanding how your Kubernetes infrastructure will play into it is important. And then understanding what ingress and egress traffic you need to handle will ensure that you're able to not only communicate with services in Kubernetes, but talk to services from Kubernetes to an external source. And one of the things that I will always say is that I, when it comes to networking, and especially talking within your enterprise, it's always the proxy. A proxy firewall server will always 
get in the way in some form or another, whether it being able to talk between services or being able to talk to external services within an organization or even externally with outside the organization, you typically have to handle being able to talk to these different services and traverse through some form of firewall proxy between different layers of your network. And finally, the final platform concern that I will talk about is storage. It is what I call the fallacy of microservices. Everyone says, oh, you don't need storage for microservices. In an enterprise scenario, you 100% will need storage. Everything from the platform needs storage to your applications being able to integrate with different parts of your organizational storage needs, whether it be storage that's already in existence or using Kubernetes as a way to bring in new storage patterns and new storage technologies into your organization. Maybe you don't have object storage now. Maybe it's something you want to start leveraging because Kubernetes and cloud native technologies like object store. And the biggest hurdle you're going to, you're definitely going to run into is the lift and shift applications, the ones that have been running on servers or heaven forbid on the mainframe for all these years, bringing them into Kubernetes or having to integrate with systems that are still living in these legacy systems. I know I have systems running on Kubernetes that talk to mainframes. They do exist. You need, you need to think about that when you start playing. And then finally, defend the platform. Always ensure that there's always going to be a bad actor, whether it be you know, someone from within the organization or someone trying to get into your system. Understanding and employing the principle of least privilege. Give people the least amount of privilege first and then uh, start opening them up as you need to. Ensure there's for various forms of auditing so you know what API calls are occurring and when things change. Using tools like Open Policy Agent or Gatekeeper can help employ these different policies and reject malicious actions on the fly. And then being able to integrate with different systems that are already within the organization and being able to already leverage these different components will allow you to get up to speed even faster. So. Myself, I'm a developer by heart. I love development. It's why I've been working with Burn, his team, for all these different years, and obviously thank him for being able to share my, my vision and, and experiences with you. Let's talk about the developer experience. So I'm going to be a, a developer by heart. Kubernetes is great. I found this wonderful example application out, out there. I want to go ahead and deploy it to my enterprise Kubernetes cluster to get started. This is going to be great. And then I realized all the hurdles that I will run into. First one is going to be, I won't be able to create cluster level resources. I won't be able to create cl custom resource definitions. I'm not going to be able to create daemon sets. I'm not going to be able to do a lot of things. A lot of times, the examples that I see on the internet, on the web, are going to be from public repositories and images. won't be able to obtain those. If I need to do builds that need to talk to uh, NPM sources for Node applications or Maven Central for Maven artifacts, I won't be able to get those dependencies. And then if I need to have these applications actually talk to external systems during runtime, it's not happening either by default. It is painful. Then you need to think about, OK, once I go ahead and I understand Kubernetes, I do get something deployed. How do I do local development on my, on my, on my enterprise provided laptop? Most organizations have everything locked down, everything from package, packages that come on, on the system command line tools like the cube control, o o OC for OpenShift, Helm, et cetera, those aren't going to be available that I can just install. How do I go ahead and run Kubernetes locally on my machine? You know, most of the time, those are going to be run in a hypervisor. Those aren't typically enabled by default. And then how do I actually get a container runtime to run? Everything from Docker, Podman. And then finally, how do I handle the actual development itself? Everything from the integrated development experience to the tooling. Everything needs to be thought of in an enterprise scenario. So if you're looking to develop or encourage development at an enterprise scale, understanding how to enable developer productivity, Lever you know, putting software that you need in an enterprise repository, making sure there's proper documentation and automation so your teams can easily get up to speed. And then as well as investigating new development methodologies. Maybe I don't want to develop on my local machine. Maybe I want to develop in a cloud-based IDE. Look at the Red Hat Code Ready workspaces. Different options for your organization to start thinking about. And then from a development standpoint, you're going to be introduced to a lot of different terms. You have, now, in an enterprise, everyone may not be up to speed on Kubernetes primitives. Everything from replicas, limit ranges and quotas, auto-scaling, scheduling options. A lot of this is foreign concepts to them. Understanding this 
at a foundational level and then providing documentation, training materials is going to make the development experience a lot easier, as well as providing example applications for your developing teams to get started will allow your developers and your application to succeed in a Kubernetes environment. And then finally, we talked about the platform. We talked about the development. Now we need to talk about the organization. We talked about these two different pieces. First of all, all of these different teams, whether it be development to operations, they're in new, te new territory. Developers have new languages and frameworks to worry about. They now need to worry about infrastructure. Before, they didn't necessarily have to worry about infrastructure. They kind of, a lot of times, threw it over the wall to them once they checked their code in. The, the, op, the DevOps team, or at least the ones that was able to get CI, CD, they were able to ensure the, package, the code was packaged and then threw it over again to the operations team that actually put it into production. Now, with Kubernetes, we have a coalescence of these different teams, which is great, but it's very hard for organizations to, under, to actually start to actually make that possible because you have a lot of different opinions and a lot, a lot of different people who are getting outside their comfort zone. It's that full stack ownership. Like from operations team, I can't tell you how many operations folks I've worked with in large enterprise scenarios that have been working on mainframes their entire lives or been working with just typical VMs or bare metal servers. Having them understand that a container can last seconds is just mind blowing to them. They're used to having machines available for years. They, they do uptime on the machine. They feel proud about that. With microservices and serverless, your container may only last a second and get spun down in seconds. I mean, it's a completely different methodology for them. So it's new roles and responsibilities that you need to introduce within the organization. This goes beyond the actual code itself. And unfortunately, a lot of times as you work through bringing Kubernetes into the organization, the organizational practices and processes do get exposed. I don't know how many times I've been brought into an organization and they said, Dan, you Kubernetes, you went ahead, it's all your fault because you went ahead and uncovered processes because you know it went through the security and compliance regulation standpoint they were going ahead and signing things off and they talked about okay how do i get certificates now oh we just go ahead and we generate it ourselves but aren't you supposed to go through a team to get that and then all these different things and these side steps and kind of back doors that are existing in the organization do get exposed so being able to understand and work with these different groups ahead of time and talking about what you need will help them mitigate any of the unforeseen um, and unflattering practices that come down the road. And then Kubernetes itself, honestly, is a marketing, it's a marketing campaign. Being able to understand and actually get buy-in from everyone is difficult. You may have a lot of people on your, on your DevOps team or on your Kubernetes team who are really adopting Kubernetes who may think it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. At an enterprise level, all the way up to the C level, they may not see it that way. They may see it as unnecessary risk to bring in this new platform. They may have had this platform that's been running stable, great for all these years. What does Kubernetes provide? Well, obviously it provides a lot, but from an organizational standpoint, it's actually having them understand the benefits of it. And especially on Kubernetes, it's usually brought in by an infrastructure team or maybe even a smaller niche team in a large multi-region, multi-siloed organization it can just get lost in among all of that. And then make the platform approachable, making sure that you make the experience a great experience. Because if Kubernetes is easy, what stops another team in a large organization from spinning up their own Kubernetes cluster themselves? And then being able to, to failure to manage all of these concepts and paradigms can eventually lead to failure if all of these things are not managed properly. And, that's all, and I've actually seen Kubernetes implementations fail. The organization just what either wasn't ready, didn't understand it, or they just didn't get it. It's, it's frustrating for a technologist like myself to see all the benefits Kubernetes can provide to see it fail. So making sure you market it properly will ensure that it's going to be successful. And doing that is really building that community within. Everything from your documentation, having documentation that your organization can take on, Having enablement sessions, working with the different teams, having lunch and learns, brown bags, et cetera. Obviously, we're a lot of times more in a more remote setting right now, but as we start to augment to the new world and we start to obviously start bringing people back into the office slowly as things start to mitigate, being able to have these either in-person or distributed ways of learning is incredibly important to understanding because it's your team's input 
that make the platform successful. And then understanding and adopting that open communication, working with the community, working with your team within your organization. I can go in and say all the best practices that I can that works with all these different organizations across the globe. But if it doesn't work for your organization that I'm working with and you're in, it doesn't mean anything. It's having input from those, everyone in the community around the Kubernetes platform, everyone from operation to development, will make it ultimately even more successful. And finally, it doesn't end there. Kubernetes itself is a journey. Plan ahead if you intend to implement Kubernetes. Don't just go ahead and throw it in and say, OK, it's ready to go, and then go ahead and roll it out. Make sure you have a plan of attack for actually adopting and implementing Kubernetes at scale within your organization. Now, if you're an organization that I've been working in, you will know some of the pitfalls and the paradigms that, that are common with your organization. Try to augment them into Kubernetes and have them be applied. And, then, and remember, every organization is at a different point in their journey. Not everyone is going to be Netflix. I mean, if you try to become Netflix on day one, you're going to fail. It, 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 it's, it's plain and simple. Understand where you are in your organizational's journey and assess what success means. If success means going in and deploying an application once a week, great. If it's deploying once a quarter versus instead of once a year, even better. It's being able, and then slowly iterate and improve upon. Okay, maybe I deploy every six months, maybe I'll deploy every every month now, and maybe every week, you know, three, four months down the road. And maybe I can get to continuous integration, continuous delivery, and then ultimately work up to maybe I feel confident with my testing and automation. I can go ahead and move to continuous deployment. It's really understanding and, and seeing how to go to the next level. It's like a big mountain. Get to the top, and then you'll be able to achieve exactly what you want through Kubernetes. I want to thank you for the time this morning, Burr. Thanks for inviting me out here. Thanks for the, being able to share some of my experiences working with the enterprise. Enterprise and Kubernetes is where my life is. I love being able to show the benefits of Kubernetes at scale to these large organizations. and. For all of you who are in an organization that is large or small, I definitely want to get some, uh, and I'm sure everyone here in the community would love to hear your input about your experiences implementing Kubernetes in your own enterprise, in your own organization. So let's keep the conversation going today. Thanks, everyone. Hey, Andrew, thank you so much for that. And so we actually have a couple questions for you because we have a few minutes left. You actually gave us a little bit of time for a couple of questions. So you ready? Perfect. I'm absolutely ready. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. All right. So one question about microservices. There's a question from uh, Guillermo. He was what he was like, well, how do I deal with my microservices? What are some best practices, strategies, thoughts, tips, techniques for microservices, but running them on OpenShift and Kubernetes? What are your thoughts there? The first one is going ahead and starting small. As you know, when you start breaking up applications into microservices, seeing how one application works and then seeing how we can distribute it out into different services. Let's say you have a big monolith where you have your application broken, uh, you know, all in one, whether it be your front end and a back end database, all on one microservice and one monolith, going ahead and deploying it in, into a more of a lift and shift, and then start breaking it up slowly in an iterative fashion. Especially in an enterprise, they like to see success in any form or another. So whether it be just getting something deployed, great. Going ahead and then seeing how you can then break it up using certain models like domain-driven development and domain-driven design, seeing where you can have those specific breaking points is key. 